Welcome to this YSL tutorial. In this video, we're going to talk about writing SQL statements using ActiveX data objects in Excel VBA. So the video is all about how you use the ADO command object in VBA to essentially write valid SQL statements which can be executed on a database. We'll start with a quick recap of how ActiveX data objects and connections work, and then show you how you can create a new command object and show you a few examples of SQL statements that we're going to be using in this video. So we're going to talk about the insert statement for adding records, update for modifying records, and delete for, obviously, deleting records. We'll show you how you can set the command text property of your command object to be a valid SQL statement, and then how to execute the command on the database to perform its action. We'll show you a couple of quick ways to generate your SQL statements automatically. So if you're more of a VBA programmer than a SQL developer, there are ways to get your SQL to be written for you, which is always nice. We'll then talk about how you integrate your SQL statements with cell contents from an Excel spreadsheet. So essentially concatenating your SQL statements together to create a form of dynamic SQL. We'll then mention some of the dangers of dynamic SQL and how you can get around some of those dangers before the last part of the video is going to start talking about how you use transactions to give you the ability to undo any changes you make with your SQL commands, and also then how you can update and delete data for the final couple of examples. So there's plenty to do, as always. Let's get started. In the previous two videos in this series, we've used ADO record set objects to get data from a database, but also to be able to modify that data as well. In this video, we're going to avoid using record sets altogether. Instead, we're going to use something called an ADO command object. And essentially, this lets you write SQL statements directly into your VBA code, which can then be executed on the database that you're connected to. It's pretty powerful stuff. So we're going to start with a quick reminder of how to connect to a database in the first place. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, as we've done it in the previous two videos already. But back to the VB editor, and I've already got a module for myself. I'm going to create a quick new subroutine called connect to DB and then a quick reminder of how to create connection objects. The first job is to declare a variable which can hold a reference to our connection object. And as ever, there are two different ways that you can do this. You can either use early binding or late binding. So here's the late binding method. I'm going to say dim movies con as an object. What I can then do is say set movies con equal to the result of the create object function. And I'm going to ask to to create a class called an adodb.connection. What I can then do is I can set properties and use methods of that connection object by say moviescom dot, um, but then with late binding you essentially have to either know or guess every single technique that you want to use. So that makes it quite inconvenient as a, as a developer. So instead let's use the early binding method. That involves going to the tools menu and choosing references and then setting a reference to the correct object library which contains the definition of this adodb connection object. So we're looking for a library called the Microsoft ActiveX Data Objects Library, and as ever, there will be several different versions installed on your machine. Just go with the latest version that you have available. That's the most sensible choice. So in my case, it's 6.1. I'm running on Windows 7. If you click OK, you can then replace the word object with adodb.connection. It actually is part of the IntelliSense now. You can actually leave the create object function in there. You can use early binding with the create object function quite happily, but I always prefer to use the new keyword instead. So instead of just saying um, create object, we're going to say new adodb.connection. And once again, you can see that it's in the IntelliSense list. The big advantage of early binding is that it gives you access to the IntelliSense for all the methods and properties of that connection object. The downside is that it's version specific. So if I check a reference to the uh, 6.1 ADO library, that might not work in somebody else's machine, whereas the late binding technique is more version independent. So having done all that, the next job is to set the connection string property of this connection object to make sure that it points to the correct database. Now, we're going to connect to two different types of databases in this video. First of all, a Microsoft Access database called Movies, sitting in a folder on my desktop, and it's in the 2007-2013 file format. And we're also going to connect to a SQL Server database, also called Movies, and that's installed in a named instance of SQL Server 2012. So we need to generate connection strings for both of those databases. And by far the most convenient way to do that is using the world famous connectionstrings.com website. And if you haven't already bookmarked this, then you should. So let's look for the access connection string first of all. I'll click the access link here in the connect section. 
and when the page is finally loaded what I'm going to do is scroll down the list to find. I don't have to scroll too far for this actually. The, um, the actual connection string I want is sitting fairly close to the top of the list here for access 2007 to 2013. So this connection string here is valid for all these different versions of access. If you have earlier versions of access, then you're welcome to click on these legacy links here. Um, I'm just going to select and copy all of that text. Head back to the VB editor. I'm going to create a constant for this um, connection string so I can quickly switch between them later on in the video. So I'm going to declare a const access constra as string equals and then inside this editable close there paste in the connection string I've just copied. Now I'll need to do a little bit of tidying up so let's take this back to a single line and of course I'll also need to modify the source so rather than pointing to this generic placeholder name I want to point to my specific folder and database name. So I'm going to use a Windows Explorer window to conveniently copy this folder path and then paste that into the appropriate place in the connection string. Then I'll also need to type in a backslash and then type in the name of the database movies. It's not case sensitive but I can't live with myself if I don't put in a capital M. There we go. So movies.accdb. Right. There's nothing else that I need to change about that connection string, so that's the access one dealt with. Let's do a similar thing for the SQL Server connection as well. So let's say const SQL constra as string equals open and close double quotes, and then we can go back to connectionstrings.com, go back to the main page, scroll down to find the SQL Server connections, wait for the page to load. There's quite a lot more options available for SQL Server. So I'm going to scroll quite a long way down this page. I'm interested in SQL Server 2012, which internally is known as SQL 11, or the native client is known as SQL 11. So there it is. I'm connecting to a named instance of SQL Server, so I'm going to use this option here. So I'm going to copy that text again. Nice and simple. Back to the VB editor, paste in the connection string into those double quotes and do a bit of tidying up. So take it back to a single line, and then I've got two different things to change. First of all I've got to change the server name which in my case is inventively called Del Vostro 2. Then the instance name is SQL 2012. Then the database name Movies. So just to show you how all that links together with the SQL Server um, Management Studio you can see that the name of the server and the name of the instance is listed here and the name of the database as I said was Movies. So that's all the connection strings dealt with. What we can do now is choose one of the two connection strings to work with. So I'm going to choose the access connection string first of all. So I'm going to set the connection string to my access constra constant. Just as a quick test then what I'd like to do is try to open up my movies connection. So I'm going to say movies con dot open and then a few lines further down I'm going to say movies con dot close. You always want to make sure that you close down your connections when you finish with them. Just as a bit of tidying up, I'm going to set MoviesCon equal to nothing once I've finished with it. That happens automatically in VBA anyway when nsub is reached, but it's good practice to release your variables when you finish with them. So what I'm looking for here is if I step through the subroutine, is I'm looking for this line not to fail. And as long as it doesn't fail, that's good, then we're good to go. Let's make sure it works for SQL as well. So I'm going to say SQL Constra. Use F8 to step through again. Make sure that this line works. It does. Close it back down again and we're now ready to start working with command objects. Now to work with a command object we're going to need to have a variable which can hold a reference to one. So let's say dim movies cmd as an adodb.command and then we can also say uh, set movies cmd equals new adodb.command. So that creates a new instance. Now, just like we did with record sets yesterday, we have to tell the command which connection to use when it gets executed. So after we've opened up the connection, let's say movies cmd dot active connection equals movies con. So that sets the connection that we're using. So you might have lots of connections open to lots of different databases. Now, once we've done all that, command objects are actually really straightforward to work with. There's one vitally important property of a command object that we need to set, and that's called its command text. So the next stage is to say movies command dot command text equals, and then we have to work out what is a valid SQL command that we can enter into this property. 
Now there are three main commands you can use for modifying data in SQL. They're to do with inserting new records, modifying existing ones and deleting old ones. So I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of what they look like in SQL Server Management Studio. So here's three separate SQL statements which will allow us to first of all insert records into a table. And this is what we're going to start with actually, we're going to choose a table to insert some records into, specify the field names or the column names and then specify the values that will go into those columns in the same order. Later on we'll look at how you can update existing records, so you can, set, you can use an update statement and set a specific field to a specific value where its condition is met. And then also you can delete records from a table as well, which is relatively straightforward. Delete from a table where this condition is true. So let's start by looking at how to insert records into a table. This just means essentially writing out this SQL statement in your VBA code as a string of text. Now, because this is going to get quite long and complex, I don't just want to try to do this in a single line. I think what I'm going to do is create a function which is going to return our command text for us. And we'll call that function several times throughout the video to get the correct set of text. So let's head down to the bottom of the module and let's declare a new function. So I'm going to give myself a few blank lines. I'm going to call my function get insert text and it's not going to have any parameters at least to begin with. I'm going to return a string from that function. So function get insert text as string. What I'll do here is declare a variable which will be my SQL string as a string and we can build up our statement inside that variable. Let's start by writing out the basic insert statement. So I'm going to say SQL string equals then I'm going to use a space underscore to continue writing this line of code on the next and in a set of double quotes I'm going to say insert into TBL film and then I can open up a set of round brackets to start listing out the field names. Now in SQL Server or in SQL in general it's not case sensitive the insert into does not have to be in capital letters it's just a convention in used in SQL where SQL command words get entered as capitals um, entirely up to you whether you follow that convention or not I'm going to stick to it because that's what I'm used to so after I've opened up the round brackets what I'm then going to do is concatenate another line so going down to the next line and here I'm going to list out the field names that I'm going to populate so I need to populate the film ID in many databases the, the ID field represents the primary key for the table and you can set this up to be automatically numbered. It just so happens that in our database, the film ID column does not have a value automatically entered. So we always need to provide one. We'll have to do that manually. So after the film ID, we can type in a comma and then say film name, and then another comma, and we'll have film release date. Obviously, it's clear here that you need to know the structure of the, your database quite well. And then we'll have film um, runtime minutes as well. So film runtime minutes. What I'm then going to do is close the round brackets, close the double quotes, another ampersand, another space underscore, and the next part of the insert into statement is going to be the values. It's going to say values, and again, open some round brackets, close some double quotes, ampersand, space underscore, and then build up the list of values on the next line. So let's just say for the sake of argument that I want to enter the value for the film ID of 999. So that's going to be the first piece of information. Then I'm going to have another comma and I'm going to enter the, the film name gravity. Now in my SQL string, the word gravity needs to be indicated as a string of text. Now in access, if we're doing this in access, you could enter this in a set of double quotes. But the problem with doing that, of course, is that we're already inside a set of double quotes to build up the SQL string. What we could do is double up the double quotes to essentially insert a single double quote into the overall string but that gets really messy really quickly so instead what we're going to do is use single quotes to enclose or delimit text in SQL this makes um, much more sense it's much easier to do first of all and it's also much more reliable SQL actually uses single quotes by default for its text delimiter. In SQL Server you have to apply special setting to your, to your database server in order to use double quotes as text delimiters in the first place. So it will be much more convenient for us if we use single quotes. Okay, again the next thing we need to fill in is the film release date and again in SQL Server dates are delimited by um, single quotes as well so they're almost treated as text. I'm going to enter my date in a specific format. It's, it conforms to an international standard, ISO 8601. So that the, that standard shows you uh, entering dates as year-month-day. Um, 
otherwise SQL Server treats dates in US formats by default. So to avoid confusion, I think this is a fairly unambiguous way to enter dates. Year, month, day, from less specific to more specific makes much more sense. Finally, we're just going to enter the value for the film runtime in minutes, and I believe that's 91 for gravity. I need to close the round brackets there, close the double quotes, and that will generate the complete SQL string that I need to insert a record into that table. All I need to do now is make sure that the function returns that value, so I can say get insert text equals SQL string, and now I can call that function in my main subroutine. scene. So rather than entering that basic string there, I can call my function get insert text. So we have our command text stored. What we now need to do is execute that command. So to do that, it's really straightforward. We simply say movies command dot execute, and that will try to execute that SQL statement on the database. So if I do that, and then I'm going to step through the subroutine. In fact, before I do that, I'll just quickly show you in the movies database, in the SQL Server database at least, if I look for um, the list of films in the film table, just to show you that that film doesn't already exist. So the last film that was added was 265. Um, so I'm going to close that table down, go back to my VB editor, and I'm going to step through the subroutine just so you can see each line happening one by one. So setting the command text isn't actually the important line. Um, this will just generate that string of text. That can't, as long as you return a string of text here, that can't possibly fail. The important line that we want to see if that works is this line here when we try to execute that statement. So if I hit F8 there, looks good to me. We can close down the connection and then close down our set movies can equals nothing. I suppose we should have also set movies command equal to nothing as well, but that will actually happen automatically when we do end sub anyway. So just a quick check then back in the SQL Server database. If I open up the film table again and have a look down at the very, very bottom, we should find that we now have a new film entered with the values that we've specified. Well, let me just check that the film runtime minutes has gone in. There it is. So there's the, um, the new film entered using a SQL command. Now it works with SQL Server clearly. We want to make sure next if it will work with Access as well. Now a couple of things we need to change here. First of all, let's change the connection string we're using to the Access connection string. That's nice and straightforward. We've also got to modify the insert text as well. And the Access database does use an auto number field for its film ID. So in fact, rather than modifying this existing function, what we're going to do is create two separate versions of the get insert text. I'm going to rename the first version as get insert text SQL, and then copy that function completely, paste it in, change its name to get insert text access, and then what we can do is modify the SQL string. So we're still going to insert into the film table, and we're still going to populate a list of fields, but we don't need to populate the film ID. So we can remove that and the first comma, Likewise for the values then, we don't need to populate the first um, film ID value, that's, um, that's going to be set automatically. And if we try to do that ourselves, it would fail. So let's remove that. We've also got to do something with the date format as well. Now access dates are delimited not using single quotes, but using hash marks. So what we're going to do is replace the single quotes with hash marks, and then we can attempt to run it. I need to modify as well the, the final lines of the um, of the, the function, so as we've changed the function names, we need to make sure that we reference the correct function name. So in the, the SQL version, we need to say get into insert text SQL, and in the access version, get insert text access. Okay, so what we can then do is return back to the main subroutine, say that I want to set the command text using get insert text access. Again, just to quickly show you in the access database that if I opened up the film table, I'm just gonna sort this in descending order of um, a film ID, so you can see that, that again, the Once Were Warriors is at the top film in the list. If I close that down, um, saving the changes to the to the design, back to VBA, and I'm going to step through this routine using F8. So again, setting the command text basically can't fail as long as you return a, a valid string, that will simply work. What's important is does this line work when we execute the command? So if I hit F8, looks pretty good to me. Nothing's failed at least. So let's have a quick look back in the Access database. Open up the film table, and there's gravity again. 
So you'll see that the formatting of the dates change based on the uh, the front end of the, the program you're working in. So in, in Access it reverts in my case to UK date format, so day, month, year. The important thing is that when we enter the date, the correct date serial was entered based on the formats we provided and there's the film runtime minutes as well. So hopefully you can see from this um, so far a couple of things. First of all that command objects are really straightforward to work with. You declare a variable, create a new command, set which connection, essentially which database to make it use, and then you simply set the command text of that command object and execute it. So clearly the most important part of this entire process is generating a valid SQL string in the first place. The next part of the video is going to show you a little bit about how you can get this to be done for you automatically. Now the biggest thing that's going to hold you back from using command objects is if you're a VBA developer you may not know your SQL commands very well. Now fortunately I can help out with that because I've made a video series all about SQL, in fact two separate series, one for writing queries in SQL and one for programming in SQL. So if you were really interested in learning SQL there's a couple of really nice video series you can watch. However, if you don't want to bother sitting through all that um, stuff and you're bored of hearing me talk to you already, what I can do is show you a couple of ways for getting both SQL Server and Access to generate valid SQL strings for you. So I'll show you quickly first in SQL Server how you can do this. If I go into SQL Server Management Studio, if you ever right click on a table, there's always an option to script the table as, and then you get various options for what you can do. So all of these options here are going to generate um, system generated uh, SQL statements. So the one we've just been looking at here was the insert into statement. So if I look for the insert to, and I choose new query editor window, what will happen is SQL Server will automatically generate a basic generic syntax for inserting data into that table. Now of course there's lots of different things that we need to change to make this actually work properly. There's lots of placeholder text here. But you can clearly see that the basic structure is exactly what we've been writing out ourselves. So there's insert into, then the name of the table, then inside a set of round brackets a list of the field names. We've seen that we don't need to list out every single field name. We can pick and choose the ones we want to modify. Then after you've finished listing out the field names, there's the values section, again in a set of round brackets, and all these placeholders would need to be changed. Um, so you need to pass in the correct specific ID number, the correct specific field name, and so on and so on. Um, so, But that, the really nice thing here is that you don't have to worry too much about working out exactly what SQL string to write yourself. You can get the SQL Server engine to do that for you. Again, there's a, a valid way to do that for the later things we'll see in the video. So there's an update to new query editor window, and there's the basics uh, statement for an update statement. And then again for the delete statement. So if I say uh, script table as delete to new query editor window, and that will generate the basic delete statement, the easiest one of the lot. Okay, so that's how to do it for SQL Server. Um, it's a nice sort of crutch if you're not that happy with using uh, or writing out SQL statements yourself. Let's have a look at how to do the same thing in Access. So let's head back into Access and the way to get Access to generate SQL code for you automatically is to create a query and it's best to do this in design view. You'll get a bit more power there than, than with the, if you use the wizard. So I choose query design. Essentially Access's query designer is just a handy graphical user interface way to generate SQL code for you. So really when you when you build your query using this query designer you're actually just creating SQL in the background. It's a little, almost a little bit like recording macros in Excel VBA. I'm not going to choose a table here for this particular example. What I'm going to try to do is generate a query that will add records to a table which is what we're trying to do in our VBA code. So once I've created the new query in design view I'm going to change it to an append query. So if you hover the mouse it says makes the query add records to an existing table, which is exactly what we're trying to do. So if I choose append, I can then choose which table I want to append my data to. I'm going to choose the film table. And if I click OK, at this point, even though I haven't filled in any fields or selected any values at all, if I change the view of my query into SQL view, then you can see that it's starting to write out the SQL statement for me. So it says insert into TBL film, and then it's got the select keyword. I'm going to switch back to the design view because what I can do now is start listing out what values I want to add to which fields. So if I set the append to option to fill name, 
then the field that I want to pass in actually isn't a field name at all. I just want to pass in a string of text. So what I'm going to do is enter into a set of um, double quotes the word gravity, preferably with a capital G, and then close the double quotes. When I hit enter, it will do some basic um, syntax changes for me. But if I go back to the SQL view now, you can see that it says insert into TBL film. And it's got the first field name in a set of round brackets. Slightly different syntax in, in Access when you do this in the, the Query Designer. Rather than saying values um, and then putting gravity in a set of round brackets, it says select gravity as expression one. Now we can happily modify that if even if we do it in the uh, in the Query Designer in Access, if you, if you can modify the SQL yourself. And I can replace the double quotes with single quotes, as we saw that could have been an issue. And I don't need to have the um, the as expression one. I could have the uh, the open and close brackets there. I didn't mention earlier on the semicolon at the end of the SQL statement in both Microsoft Access and SQL Server. The semicolon is a, is an optional statement terminator. You don't need to put it in, but in most system generated code, it will add that in for you. Um, it's up to you whether you include it for Access or SQL Server. Things will work without them if you don't want to put them in, and with them if you do. So that's the basic idea of having Access generate the insert statement. Just to quickly mention, if I close that query down and without saving the changes, we can do the same thing to getting, for getting the update and delete statements as well. So if I create a new query in Design View, I'm going to choose the film table this time because I want to update the film table. So I can close that window down and then change the query to an update query. So again, if I choose to, I don't know, change the film runtime minutes field, update it to a value of 180, oops, 180, where the film runtime minutes is already longer than 180. Then if I look at the SQL view again, you'll get exactly the same syntax generated that SQL Server generates for you. Last little one to have a quick look at. Close that one down, don't save the changes. New query and design view. If I again choose the film table, a delete query is really straightforward if I choose delete. And then I can simply say delete records from the film table, let's say where the runtime minutes is longer than 180, for example. So again, if I look at the SQL view, I've got all the SQL code written out for me, which I can almost just copy and paste without making any changes at all into my VBA code. So there's a quick preview of how you can get both Access and SQL Server to generate your SQL code for you. For the rest of the video now, we're going to assume that we know enough about SQL to write it out ourselves, but always bear in mind that you can always rely on both SQL and Access to generate it for you if you're not happy doing that yourself. Okay, so now that we've seen how to add explicit values into a new record in the database, let's have a look at how we could read the contents of Excel cells into those new records. Basically, what we're going to do is loop over this list and add a new film for each row. And that means incorporating the cell contents into our uh, SQL statements. We're going to have to be careful about any text which contains single quotes, because as we've just seen, we're using single quotes as the text delimiters in our statements. So things like Marvel's The Avengers and Europe's Most Wanted here, we need to consider how we handle these little single quotes to make sure that the statements will still work. But the first job, let's do this in an Access database first. What we need to do is modify our function so that it will accept some values because we want to be able to call this function for each new row of our spreadsheet to insert a new film. So let's start by adding some parameters to our function definition. We need to add three parameters for our function to work. So we need to pass in a film name, a release date, and a runtime minutes. So let's just define these quite simply. Let's call them film name as string, followed by a comma. Then we'll have film date as date. To be honest, it doesn't really matter which data type you use in the long run because the film date is eventually going to be converted into a string anyway. But using the date data type makes sure that you get at least a small amount of validation. If we try to pass in something which isn't a date into the function, then we'll at least generate runtime errors, data type mismatch errors. So let's use the date data type for film date. And likewise, for film time, we will use um, the integer data type. So that will allow us to hold a whole number. And again, we'll get validation errors if we try to pass in something which isn't a number. So those are the three parameters for the function defined. The next thing we need to do is start incorporating them into our SQL string. 
Now at a basic level, this simply involves concatenating the value of each parameter into the existing string, so replacing the word gravity by concatenating a reference to the film name parameter. But it's not quite so simple. Remember we have to take into account things like single quotes in our film name string, and we want to make sure that we format our date in the correct way as well. So what we're going to do, I'm just going to tidy things up a little bit. I'm going to try to build each piece of information on a separate line. So what I'm going to do first of all is, after the word gravity and a comma, I'm going to type in a double quote and then an ampersand a space underscore and take the date down to the next line. Open a double quote at the start of that line and then again after the comma close some double quotes space ampersand space underscore and then I can fill in the film runtime or the film time on the last line. So that makes sure I can separate out each individual bit of information. Let's deal with the film name next then. So I want to concatenate a single quote character to the start of, let's just go with the word gravity for the moment, and then after the word gravity, I want to concatenate a close single quote and a comma before I then bring in the release date. So instead of putting in the word gravity here, of course, we're going to reference our film name parameter. So let's replace the word gravity with a reference to film name. Now, as long as the film name doesn't contain any illegal characters, that will work absolutely perfectly. However, we've got to make sure we take into account those single quote characters. Now, in a similar way to handling um, double quotes in a VBA string, you can double up the double quotes. In SQL, you can double up the single quotes to make sure that you concatenate a single double quote into the phrase. And we can use a VBA function called replace to find any instances of a single quote in our film name string and replace that with a double single quote. So let's have a look at the replace function. I say replace, open brackets. The first argument of this is the, uh, the expression or the string I'm trying to look for a value in. Then after the film name, we can tell it to search for a single quote character. And then we can say that if it finds a single quote, we can replace those with two double quotes, uh, sorry, two single quotes. And then close around brackets, and that will handle the film name happily. Now we need to do something similar to make sure that the date goes in in the correct format. So just as we did on the previous line, let's close a set of double quotes to make sure we get the opening hash mark character. Then we can have a space and an ampersand to join on the actual date in a moment. Let's just leave the existing date in there for the time being, and then type in another space after the date, another ampersand, and open a set of double quotes to concatenate the close hash mark, and then the comma to move on to the next value. Now, again, we're going to replace, first of all, just the um, the existing date with a reference to our film date parameter. So there it is. And we also want to make sure that this goes in in the correct format as well. So we're going to use the format function to do this. So if I say format open brackets, you can see that it takes an expression, so that can be almost any value. Then the second parameter is what format you want to place this in. So after film date, I'm going to type in a comma, then open some double quotes, and the date format that we want, if we want to follow this ISO 8601 format, we're going to go for Y, 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 so that's, that puts the, the year in, in a four-digit year, then a dash, and then two M's for the month, then another dash, and two M's, oh, sorry, two D's for the day, and then close the double quotes, close the round brackets, and that will put the date in the correct format as well. We've finally got to handle the film time, as we've called it in the uh, in the parameter list. So this is this is the most straightforward one of the lot. All I need to do is take away the actual number that I passed in there, and making sure that I need to have a close round bracket as a very last character. So just before that, I'm going to say film time ampersand and then close round bracket. Now VBA uses a feature called implicit data type conversion. So even though we're passing in the film time as a number, it will automatically be coerced into a string because we're concatenating it with other strings. If it made you feel better, you could use the CSTR function, CSTR, to make sure that the, uh, the film time gets explicitly converted into a string. Um, that's just for the sake of um, completeness, if you like. You do not need to do this in VBA. 
um, data type conversions work implicitly and you can always convert something into a string that's always going to work so it's entirely up to you whether you put the C string function in there or not um, I'm gonna leave it in there as I've taken the effort to type it in so that should now generate a valid SQL string based on the values passed into the function let's see if we can use it to loop over our list of films adding a new film for each record that we encounter so that means going back to our main subroutine and we'll have to have a couple of extra variables here as well so let's declare a new variable or at least one variable dim r as range and once we've created our new connection object and open that up and created our new command object and set up its connection property what we want to do here is generate a new command text and execute that command each time we encounter a new film so these are the two lines that essentially are going to loop over our list of films so let's indent those and then just above those lines what we're going to do is say for each r in now the range of cells that we want to loop over is on sheet 1 from cell A3 down to A15 but I want to make sure that this works regardless of how long the list is so what we're going to do is we're going to say back in the VB editor for each R in range A3 try that again A3 comma range A3 dot end Excel down that's just a quick convenient way to get the entire list it assumes that there are no gaps in the list at all so it will stop if there are any gaps in the list but that's more than enough for our basic example we need to make sure that we do move on to a next uh, next row the next cell in that um, in that loop so let's say next R at the end and then all we've got to do is modify the way that we call this function because we've now got to pass in a number of um, arguments to each of the film or get insert text access function parameters so let's see how we can do that what I need to do and I think I'll break this down onto multiple different lines just to make sure I can see the whole thing on one single screen with so I'm gonna say movies command dot command text equals then a space underscore and I'm gonna get the get insert text access on a new line and then I'm gonna have a space underscore after the open brackets and the film name is going to be provided by R dot offset zero comma one dot value so that's the value of the cell one column to the right of column A so if I type in a comma then and another space underscore I know that the film date must be offset two columns to the right and therefore the film runtime must be offset three columns to the right nice and straightforward nice and consistent oops three not twenty three dot value then close around brackets and that should successfully generate the string for our insert statement right let's see if this will work now I'm just going to quickly show you the access database table so let's go back to the film table in access and uh, you can see that gravity was the last film that was added there so we know that we haven't already added those films let's close that table down and back to the VB editor and we're connecting to the access database that's good and we're calling the access get insert text function so let's just in fact let's step through the first few lines just to make sure it's going to go for the first couple of rows so this will generate the command text that works happily that's not the line we're really worried about what we're really worried about is does this line work so I hit F8 to run that it seems to have happened and it's going to do this for each row now in that sheet so let's hit the run button the play button to just run all the way through to the end it seems that everything's worked let's head back into access quickly open up the film table and there are all of our new films fantastic so have we successfully handled the uh, the, in, the the single quote so we've got Marvel's the Avengers with a single quote there and we should also have Europe's most wanted there with a single quote superb so that's one way to make this um, this system work looping over a collection of cells generating a valid SQL statement for each row and then executing that one by one now that we've got things working in access let's have a look at what we need to change to make it work for SQL Server as well so let's start by modifying the connection string we're gonna go for the SQL connection string and we'll also call the SQL version of our function as well now there are several changes we're going to have to make to the function the main thing involves actually changing it to take into account the fact that we don't get an automatically generated ID number so we're gonna to have to calculate that now as I said before this is this is not a feature of SQL Server this is purely because this 
particular database has not been designed to have auto number fields. Nevertheless, we're going to have to deal with that in this particular function. So let's start by copying the, um, the parameters from our access version of the function. We'll need to pass all of those in when we call on the function, so we might as well copy those. And then we could also, let's see, we could also copy, in fact, most of this that generates the SQL string. Let's copy the entire expression which generates the SQL string and replace the existing one in the SQL server function. So let's paste that in. Now, of course, access uses hash marks to delimit dates. SQL Server uses single quotes. So let's replace the hash marks here to enclose the date in single quotes. And then the next bit is working out how we handle the film ID. So let's incorporate the film ID field name in the list of fields. And then let's give ourselves an extra blank line in between the values. So the first value we're going to have to calculate now is the value of the film ID field. So let's put in a pair of double quotes and then an ampersand and a space underscore. Now, essentially what we want to do is find out what the current highest value in the film ID field is, and then simply add one to that number to create the next ID number in the sequence. It's a bit of a low tech solution, but it will work. Now, if I wanted to do that in SQL Server, what I could do is, if I just quickly show you in a new query window, I could write a statement which says select max film ID from TBL film. And if I execute that query, that will show you that the current highest number is number 999. That's what we added for the, the film Gravity earlier on. So I'll just quickly show you that. That's the current highest value of the ID number. Okay, so if I said simply um, plus one to that number, so if I wrap that query up into a set of round brackets and say plus one, that will essentially generate that result plus one. So that's what I can actually incorporate into my select statement, sorry, into my insert statement in my VBA code. SQL supports the nesting of statements, so I can write essentially what's, what's a subquery in the insert into statement. So inside that set of double quotes there, I'm going to open and close a set of round brackets. And then inside there, I'm going to say select max open and close brackets. Inside those brackets, I'm going to say film ID. And then from TBL film. And then after that expression, I'm going to say simply plus one. Don't forget that I need a comma then to separate the value of that field from the value of the next one, which would be the film name and then the date and then the film time. And that's essentially all we need to do to make this work in SQL Server. So let's head back up to the main subroutine. I'm actually just going to quickly go back to SQL Server and I'm going to delete the um, the film that we added in earlier, the gravity film. So I'm going to make sure that we've got the um, the last film that was added is the same as the one that was in the access stage base number 265, Want to a Warrior. So I'm going to delete that, choose yes to do it. And then if we head back to the VBA and run the subroutine, what we ought to find is that everything appears to work correctly. Back to SQL Server, open up the table again. And if I scroll all the way down to the bottom, there is our new list of records starting from number 266. So there we go, two successfully written functions that allow us to insert data into two different types of databases. Now what we've done so far in this example is essentially generate single SQL statements or commands and executed them one by one. But when we're connected to a SQL Server database, we can actually build a whole sequence of commands into one single command text property and then execute them all at the same time. So to demonstrate how that works, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the, the execute method of the command to after the loop. So what that means is I'm going to build up the entire set of, of commands or statements into a single command text property. And that means as I'm building this row by row, I'll need to concatenate the new statement to the end of the existing command text. So I'm going to copy that command text and make that equal to itself and the result of the function that we generated earlier on. Now there's one more additional thing I'm going to do. I don't know if you remember earlier on, I mentioned that there was an optional statement terminator in SQL, which is the semicolon. It's optional in both SQL Server and in Microsoft Access. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add that semicolon character to the result of my function. So it means that once I've built one single statement, one single insert into statement, it has a terminator for that statement right at the end. 
Okay, so what I can do now, in fact, rather than trying to execute this, what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to debug.print the result of this um, full set of statements. So I'm going to say debug.print movies command dot command text. Once I've done that, let me just view the immediate window. And if I run the entire subroutine from start to finish, so we're not actually going to um, execute the command at this point, we're just going to print out the final command text. If I execute the whole thing, here's what we get. So you can see I've got the start of my first insert into statement, and then we get the list of values for that, which is Marvel's The Avengers and so on and so on. And then when that one's finished, there's the semicolon statement terminator, and we get into the next insert into statement. And that just carries on. For every insert into statement we generate, we have a semicolon separating that one from the next, and a final semicolon right at the very, very end. Okay, so having seen that we've generated the correct or a valid string, let me uncomment that line, remove my debug.print statement, and just before I run it, let's have a look at the, um, the movies table. So if I look at the film table in the movies database, and just to show you that we've only got, what was the last number? The last number that was added was number 278. So if I close that down, head back to the VB editor and run the whole thing in one go, back to SQL, open up that table again, and what we should see this time is even more records. So every time we run this, we execute all those insert, insert statements as a single batch, which is offers a couple of simple advantages to, to executing individual statements one by one, um, but it's an interesting thing to see that you can do with, with SQL Server. Now, although we can do this quite happily for SQL Server, we can't do the same thing for Microsoft Access. Using the same technique, if I just incorporate a semicolon statement terminator at the end of my Access command text, so there it is. If I attempted to then modify this so I'm looking at the Access connection string and calling on the Access um, function, so movies command command text equals uh, text SQL, text Access is what I want to say here. So that calls the access version of the function. If I attempt to run this one, just quickly show you in the, in the table that we've got 279 is the last record. If I attempt to run this one, what's going to happen is I'm going to get a runtime error. And this is actually generated by Microsoft Access. When you're, um, when you're doing this, it says if it finds characters after the end of a first SQL statement. So with the semicolon statement terminator, Access automatically checks if there's anything after that semicolon, and it prevents you from executing more than one statement at the same time. I'm just going to click the debug button here. And what I want to be able to do is just make sure that I close down my movies connection. So I'm going to drag my yellow arrow so it does actually close down the movies connection. So it'll run all the way through to the end. And I'll see that if I go back to Access, that I haven't added any new records at all. So why on earth does Access do this to us? Why does it not allow us to write out multiple um, statements while SQL Server does. Now this is probably easiest to demonstrate if I switch back to using SQL Server just for this little section. So I'm going to go back to the SQL Server connection string and I'm going to go back to getting my um, results, my query string from the SQL version of the function. Essentially what we're doing here, each of these functions is generating a form of something called dynamic SQL. And all dynamic SQL is, is a string of text that's concatenated out of various different component parts. Now whenever you're generating dynamic SQL, any sort of unscrupulous person, shall I call them, who knew a little bit about how SQL works, has the opportunity to insert things into that SQL string that can cause things to go horribly, horribly wrong. What I'm going to do to demonstrate this is back in SQL Server, I've actually created a quick table called TBL test. There's no data in it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert something into my Excel spreadsheet that will cause that table to be deleted. So back into the, um, the Excel spreadsheet, what I'm going to do is at the end of, in fact, I could do this at the end of any single one of these film runtime in minutes. I'm going to pick the first one just for the sake of convenience. And I'm going to edit the text in there. What I'm going to do is after the number 143, I'm going to close some round brackets and then type in a semicolon. And we've already seen that the semicolon is a statement terminator in SQL. What I'm then going to do is write out a new statement called drop table TBL test. And we haven't seen the drop statement, but drop table is another SQL statement that you can pass into an, uh, an adodb.command object. And once I've done that action, I'm going to type in another semicolon 
which will end, end or terminate that statement. And then I'm going to type in two dashes. The dashes are examples of the, the comment character in SQL. So you know how in VBA we can enter a comment by typing in a single quote. In SQL, the dash dash symbol is used to indicate comments. So what this means is in the full SQL string that I generate, after the first number for the first film that I'm entering, um, I'll get a, that that statement will be terminated, and then another statement gets inserted, drop table, and then that one is terminated, and then everything after that is going to be considered to be a comment. So all the insert statements relating to the next list of films is going to be commented out. Now then, there is one other small tweak I'm going to have to make to make this system work. If I just go back to the VB editor, we do have one small safety net in the way our function works because the film time parameter is expecting an integer. If it isn't an integer, then it's going to fail with a type mismatch error. So just to show you that this will work if this was being passed in as a string, let me just quickly do that. Um, so having done all of that and just reassuring you that at the moment the test table is still there, if I were to go back to the VB editor and then run this entire subroutine, so I'm not even going to bother testing it, I'm just going to run the whole thing from start to finish, and everything appears to have worked. If I switch back to SQL, however, although at the moment I can still see my test table, when I refresh this folder, can you see the test table's disappeared? Dun dun dun. So that's the uh, the big problem with generating dynamic SQL. Now, of course, as you've seen, it depends on which type of database you're connecting to. SQL is a bit more flexible. It allows users to pass in multiple statements in one single command. But because Axis is a slightly more, I suppose, basic database application, and because of the, the, the possibility of dynamic SQL doing horrible things to the database, they have built in some sort of validation to make sure you can't pass in multiple statements. This is something you definitely, definitely have to be aware of if you're going to be attempting this sort of thing in VBA. Be very, very careful of dynamic SQL and unscrupulous people passing in strings that try to break your database. There's even a famous cartoon, I don't know if you guys have seen the XKCD website, but there's, a, there's a, one of their most famous Cartoons is uh, this one, Exploits of a Mom. Give that a quick uh, quick Google, it's quite amusing if you know anything about SQL. Anyway, having done all of that, let's see what we could possibly do to, um, to prevent this from happening in our own database. I guess, obviously, one thing is that we could make sure that if we're passing in the film time, then that should always be passed in as an integer. So that would have solved that problem in the first place. If I just kept that as an integer, I wouldn't have been able to do that because of the type mismatch error. Um, but it might well have been the case that the final parameter was passing in a string. So how could we test if the return value of our um, of our string did not contain the drop keyword? So we're going to add a little bit of validation to our insert text SQL function to make sure that this will work. Now, one way to test if a string of text exists inside another in VBA is to use the instra function, which is short for in string. So just before we get our function to return a value, we're going to say if instra, open brackets, and then there are several parameters we're going to fill in. The first one is the start position for your search. So it's the character index of the, the character you want to start searching from. If you type in the number one, we start searching from the start of the string of text. Make sense? The second parameter, string1, it could have been better named, but this basically wants to know which string of text you are looking in. So we're looking in our SQL string variable. The third parameter is which string of text you're looking for. So what we're going to say here is looking for the word drop. Now by default, based on the default settings in, uh, in VBA, in string works on a case sensitive basis. So if I search for the word drop in lowercase, it's not going to find it if it if I have the word drop typed in in uppercase. So there are a couple of different ways we could handle that. We could use the L case function to convert our SQL string into all lowercase text. So to do that we'd say L case open bracket SQL string close brackets, so that converts the SQL string into all lowercase text. Alternatively, you could use the fourth parameter of the instra function. So you could say, if it's having a comma after the, uh, the drop parameter, we could tell the, the instra function to compare based on text. So that makes this completely case insensitive. So that's the method I'm going to use. I'm going to use the VB text compare option there. So if I close around brackets, now if the instra function does not return a match. If it doesn't find the word we're looking for, then it returns zero. So I want to check if it does not return zero. So if the result of this function is not zero, then we want to do something.
Now, just before we go any further, there's a couple of other considerations to make here. If I had a film name which contained the word drop, then our if statement will pick up on that film, even though we're not trying to do something naughty to the database, it will still pick up the film as though it was trying to drop a table. So there are several other ways you might want to be able to test for this. You might want to consider just the word drop by itself. So you could type in a space after the word drop to make sure that it finds, finds for instance, as we saw there, uh, drop table. So there's a space after the word drop. In the way I've written it out here, there's a space before the word drop as well, and then a semicolon before that. This would have still worked, by the way, if there was no space after the semicolon. So it could be semicolon drop or semicolon space drop. So as you can see from this, there are lots of different uh, ways that a user could try to make something bad happen to your database. So what you'll find happening in the real world is you'll probably need to test multiple different instances of this. So what we could do is, is for instance, in this example, because I've been a semicolon and a space, drop space. Another test would be drop space by itself. Another test might be semicolon drop with no space and so on and so on and so on. For this example, we're just going to test for the word drop, and so be it, if there were any films with the word drop in their titles, this would still throw an error. So we'll that's the if statement itself, let's write the end if statement, and then we can just say what we want to do if we encounter the drop keyword in our SQL string. What we'll do for our example is get the function to raise an error to the calling subroutine if it encounters the drop keyword. So to do that we can say er dot raise. Now we've covered error handling in several previous videos, in fact there's a single dedicated video that's all about error handling, but I'm not sure we've ever mentioned about raising custom errors before now. So if you raise a custom error, there are several things you should provide. First of all, you must provide an error number. Now the numbers for the errors is quite a long large range, about 60 0 to 65,500 numbers, but there's a certain range that's reserved by the system. So what you can do to find out what numbers are, are acceptable is click on the word raise and then press the F1 key on your keyboard, and that will take you to the help page, which in this version of Office is actually um, a web browser system. So you can see the raise um, method of the uh, object, and we're looking at the number parameter here. So this is a number between 0 to 65,500 or so, but there's between 0 and 512 is reserved for system errors. So we've got to use a number that's above 512, basically. It gives you a little hint about how to generate the, um, the correct error number by using a simple expression. So we're going to add a number to the constant VB object error. So I'm just going to copy that code out. And then I'm going to go back to my VB editor. And after the, the raise method for the first number parameter, I'm going to say Control V to paste it in. I'm not going to use the number 513, that's fairly meaningless, isn't it? I guess the number I'm going to use, 600, is fairly meaningless as well, um, but it's just a bit better than 513. Um, so if I type in a comma, the next parameter then is the source of the error. So usually this is the name of this function or the subroutine which is raising the error in the first place. You don't have to provide that. Um, a quick description again says the source um, of the error there. So we're not going to bother with the source parameter. That's not going to be a useful piece of information to us. What we're going to do instead is move straight on to the description parameter, which can be anything you like, basically. So it's just something that describes why this error has happened in the first place. So I'm going to call create my description. I'm going to call it something like, oh, I know, um, naughty words used. There we go. That's quite, um, quite obvious, isn't it, what's going on? So there's the way that we raise the error. What we need to do now is incorporate that in some kind of error handling system in the main subroutine. So, just before we try to call this function, on the line just above this one, we're going to write an on error statement. We're going to say on error and go to, and I'm just going to generate a basic error handler. So I'm going to say error handler for the name of the label I'm going to jump to. I'm going to copy that keyword head down towards the bottom of the subroutine and paste that word in, type in a colon after it, which converts it into a label or a bookmark. So if an error happens after this point, it will jump straight to this label and run any code beneath it. Now there's a couple of other things we should do as well. We only want to test for this specific error in this line of code. So I'm going to say on error go to zero immediately afterwards, and that will reset the customer handler back to normal error handling status. Again, that's talked about in much more detail in the video on error handling. We also want to make sure that we can't reach the error handler unless we get there by generating a runtime error. So we must write exit sub 
immediately before the error handler, otherwise the code will just continue and run straight through it anyway. So the exit sub means we can only get to the error handling section if we, um, we generate a runtime error in this line. Okay, so that's the, uh, the error handling sort of system created. We've just got to work out what we want to do when the error actually occurs. I guess we should show a message to the user to tell them what error has occurred. So let's use a message box to do that. And the first part of the message, the prompt, is going to be error number equals, and then I'm going to calculate what the error number is. Now I can do that by saying er.number. So that will tell me the number that's been generated um, from our raise error method earlier on. But I also have to make sure that I subtract from that the VB object error value, otherwise I'll just get some ra completely random number altogether. So I'll make sure that I get the number 600. Okay, so I have a closer parentheses then. I'd also like to have a new line character, so I'm going to say VB new line. And then after that, I'm going to show the description of the error as well, so er.description. I guess we could also display different symbols on the message, like a critical symbol and so on, using the, the other parameters of the message box. But I'm just going to stick with what I've got for the time being, just a nice simple message. So on the next line, the other thing that we also want to do is make sure that we close down the movie's connection. If something goes wrong here, then of course we jump over that line, and we don't, we, we're left with the connection left open. And we don't want that to be the case. So I'm going to repeat the line that says moviescon.close. I suppose we could also say set movies con equals nothing, but that will happen automatically anyway, as I've said before. So with that done, there's just one more change that we need to make as well to make this system work before we test it. If you remember that I switched back to setting the film time parameter to being an in integer, which is actually one much simpler way to validate this whole system. If I, if I try to pass in something which is not an integer into that um, parameter, then the whole system fails anyway. But let's just switch it back to a string for now and give it one more quick test. So I'm going to set a break point on my on error statement line. That means I can run the subroutine up to that point and then use the F8 key to step through. So when I use F8 here, it's going to call my subroutine or function, sorry. And there we go. We're, we're going to pass in all these various values, including a film time value, which includes the drop table keywords. So if I use the F8 key again to continue stepping through, then I can um, build the SQL string as usual and now my if statement checks what the result of the tricking looking for the word drop in my SQL string is so it returns the number 166 which means that the word drop begins at the 166th character in that entire SQL string which clearly is not the same as zero so we're going to raise an error which will take us straight back to the error handler in our calling subroutine so as soon as you do this we go straight to the error handling section, show this message box, error number number 600, naughty words used. So if I click OK, then we can close the connection and end the subroutine. So there's a way to handle dynamic SQL naughtiness, I suppose, if people try to insert um, horrible keywords or horrible statements into your SQL statements. You can prevent them from happening using error handlers similar to this one. Now this kind of system works reasonably well when we're building up a sequence of SQL commands or SQL statements into a single command text property, then executing everything all at the same time. But if you remember, we couldn't do that with Microsoft Access, and it might be the case that we decided to execute individual instructions on our SQL Server database as well. So in fact, I'm just going to switch my code back to using that, that basic earlier version. So I'm going to remove my breakpoint and then remove the line which concatenates the command text to itself and then I'm going to move the execute statement back into the for each loop. I'm going to do that just after the error handling statement as well. Okay, so there we go. Now, what's going to happen now, of course, is that I'm going to build up a SQL string and then immediately execute that SQL string to insert a record, then do it again and insert another record and so on and so on and so on. Now, imagine we were doing that, but it wasn't the first film that gave us a problem. Let me move this value. So I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to place it into a different film's running time instead. Here's Skyfall. That's got the same running time as, as the Avengers, so that's convenient. So I'm going to paste that in there. Then I'm going to change this cell back to just being 143. Okay, so when we run this now, the way our system works, we're going to successfully insert this record, and then this one, and then this one, and then we'll get to the point where Skyfall will cause an error. So at that point, we will have failed to insert a record, and none of the other records will be inserted. So let's imagine then that we solved the problem, we found out what the issue was, and we changed that back to a standard number, and then we tried to run the subroutine again. 
Of course, at that point, we'd already have the first three films in the database, so we'll be adding those ones again, as well as all the extra ones. So we want to avoid that from happening, and one way to do that is to incorporate the use of transactions into our error handlers. So I'm going to go back to the VB editor, and we're going to have a quick look at how you can incorporate transactions into this code. Now I've made a complete video on how transactions work that's part of the SQL Server programming series. I'm not going to encourage you to go away and watch that one right now. Um, just to give you a quick summary, basically when you begin a transaction, it tells your database to remember any changes that you make to any data until you decide to either commit those changes or roll them back. So the idea behind a transaction is we begin it before we attempt to make any changes to our data at all. So what I'm going to do is just before we start our loop, I'm going to say movies con dot begin trans. So a transaction is associated with a connection object, not with a command object. What that does then is every time we make a change to the data, then SQL Server remembers what change that was made. So it, it's essentially like setting a save point, I suppose, in your in your database. What we could then do is if we find that we raise an error by trying to insert something um, with the drop table statement in it as our function now works what we could do is in part of our error handling code just before we close down the connection we could say movies con dot roll back trans so that would essentially undo any changes to data that have been made up to the point um, or, or, or prior to the point that we we um, began this transaction We'd also have to make sure that if everything worked properly, then before we close down the connection um, and everything had worked successfully, we'd need to make sure that the transaction was committed. So to do that, we'd say just before we close the connection normally, we'd say moviescon dot commit trans. So you must always do one of two things. When you begin a transaction, you must always either commit it or roll it back. You can't leave your transaction hanging. Your DBAs will get very upset with you if you leave your transactions open. So with all that code written, let's give this one a quick test. I'm going to just um, save this subroutine at this point, and we're going to step through the subroutine to see what happens. Before we do that, let's just have a quick reminder of what's in the SQL Server table at this point. So if we go back to SQL Server Management Studio and open up the movie table and scroll down to the end, we should see the last record is number 278, Lincoln. So what we should see at the end of this subroutine the first time we run it is no extra records after that point. So let's close down that table and then let's go back to the VB editor and I'm going to set a break point again on the on error statement so I can run that up to that point and then I can pause and use the F8 key to step through. So F8 to step through. This will generate hopefully a valid SQL string the first time because the number 143 is in the film's runtime this time. So the instring function finds that looking for the word drop returns the number zero, which means that the if statement isn't triggered, we don't raise the error, we get the insert text, and then we execute that statement and that film has now been added to the database. It hasn't been saved yet. When you begin a transaction, until you commit it, the data has not yet been saved, but it is actually inserted into the table successfully. So we'll carry on going through, and the next film will work as well because this has got a sensible running time. So this one will work. Let's just quickly go through that. Then one more time, this one will work because it's number 142, and that's inserted as well. This time, however, this is the film whose running time is not valid. This is where the word drop appears in the running time. So this is going to raise our error. And at this point, it's going to trigger our error handler, show us the message, naughty was used. We should probably tell the user that any existing records will then be removed, or any, any records added since, since we started will be removed. We'll roll back the transaction, and then close the connection, and end the subroutine. So, if all that's worked as intended, what we should find is, if I go back to SQL Server and open up the film table, edit all rows, we should find that the last record again is still number 278, Lincoln. So let's just quickly check this to make sure it does work if we enter completely valid data. Back to Excel first. I'm going to remove this um, silly statement and replace it with the number 143. So if I go back to the VB editor again, I'm not going to bother stepping through the subroutine this time. I'm going to remove my breakpoint. I'm just going to run the whole thing through from start to finish. Look back to SQL Server. Open up the table one more time. And have a look at the end. We should see numbers more than 278 this time. So there we go. We get a completely new set of all those records. 
because we committed the data to the database. So that's the beauty of using transactions. They're absolutely fantastic when you're writing error handling code in VBA to talk to databases. If you're modifying data at all and anything goes wrong, as long as you chose to begin a transaction before you modified something, you can always revert back to the previous status using rollback. Then when you're happy that everything's worked, you can commit it using commit. I realize that we've spent a long time talking about the insert statement in this video, but it's important to realize that exactly the same techniques that we've used here will work for any of the other SQL statements as well. So if we're talking about simply modifying data, the update statement and the delete statement, but also more complex things like create and drop, as we've seen the drop table statement clearly works when you pass it into a command object. So I just wanted to do a couple of quick extra examples here with the update and the delete method. I suspect it's fairly unlikely you'll be creating and deleting tables from VBA code, but I think certainly updating and deleting records might be something you'll, you'll be uh, interested in doing. So just a couple of techniques for using updates first and then, up, and then delete to finish off the video. So back to the VB editor. What I'd like to do for this example is assume that maybe the lengths of our films change on a regular basis. And I'd like to be able to loop over my collection of films in the spreadsheet and update the database to have the modified version of the film length. So I want to do this in Microsoft Access. We've done quite a lot in SQL Server today in this video. So let's revert to Access just for a bit of variety. If I head back to the VB editor, one of the nice things I can do here is just pretty much copy the definition of my insert text function for access. So I'm going to copy that whole thing. It's worth bearing in mind that if you're working in the SQL Server, this will still work, of course. So if you're using SQL Server, please feel free to follow this through using SQL rather than access. I'm going to modify the name of the function, of course, to get update text access. And then I don't need to include the film date parameter in the definition of my function, so I'm going to remove that. I've made sure that I've gone back to a, an integer data type for the film time as well. And then essentially what I've got to do is, is just modify the, um, the SQL string that's returned to make sure that it's an update statement instead. So let's remove everything apart from a pair of double quotes and then work out how to write a sensible update statement. Now there's essentially three main parts to an update statement and the first part's really simple. It's just the name of the table that you're trying to update. So I'm going to say update TBL film. Then for the next part I'm going to put that on the next line. So I'm going to use an ampersand space underscore. And at the start of the next line I'm going to start another set of double quotes. A space. I want a space in between the name of the film table and the start of the next part of my statement. I could have put that in there actually but I've decided to include it at the start of the next line. So the next statement says, the next part of the statement says what field you're trying to set. So we're trying to set film runtime minutes equal to, and we're trying to set that to be equal to whatever value gets passed in by the film time parameter. So here we can, concat we can concatenate in the film time parameter and then another ampersand space underscore to go to the next line. At the start of the next line, we include a WHERE clause to make sure that we only change this field for a specific record or records. If we miss out the WHERE clause, then just all the film runtime minutes values changes in the entire table. So let's add a WHERE clause, WHERE film name equals, then I need to open up a set of single quotes, close to double quotes, ampersand, film name, ampersand, open double quotes, close single quotes and I'm also going to incorporate this statement terminator here, the semicolon as well. So the um, the single quote here and here will enclose the film name in the final statement and that is essentially the end result of our SQL string. We've got to modify the name of the function of course so we're getting update text access rather than getting insert text access so let's say get update text access that's the name of the function and I suppose we should probably think about incorporating the error handling code as well. It's just as possible for somebody to try to delete a, um, a record using the, the drop statement in our function um, as it is when they were trying to insert records. Of course, as we're working with an access database, we can only pass in a single statement at a time anyway. So the statement terminator, if any characters at all appear after that statement terminator, then access will prevent us from continuing in the first place. So we can actually get away without adding the error handling code to the access function. Now before we head up and incorporate this function into our main subroutine, there's one more thing we've got to do. I almost forgot, but of course our film names can contain single quote characters within them. So as we handled it last time, we used the replace function. I'm just going to cheat here and copy and paste that 
into this function as well. So I'm going to copy the replace function and put it in place of the fill name. So that makes sure that any single quotes get replaced with a sequence of double quotes, which means that everything will then work happily. OK, so having done all of that, we can now go back up and incorporate this into our main subroutines. Let's scroll all the way back up to the top. I think just to make things a little bit more clear in this example, I'm going to get rid of all the error handling code. We won't trigger an error handler anyway because of the function that we're going to call. So let's remove that section of code altogether. makes it a little bit easier to read. And also the error handling statements, the on error statements. Let's get rid of those too. So I'll get rid of those. We need to make sure that we're connecting to the access database, not the SQL Server one. So let's change the connection string that we use to the access connection string. And of course, the main thing is we've got to change which function we're calling. We're going to call the get update text access function. This function, of course, only accepts two parameters. So at the moment, we're still trying to pass in three, which includes the film's date. But we don't need to do that anymore. We can get rid of the line which passes in the, the date of each film, because all we need to do to make this function work is pass in the name and the runtime. Now what we haven't done yet is actually changed any of the runtimes of any of our films, so let's go away and make some changes to the running times before we try to run this subroutine. So let's head back into Excel and let's change some of the running times. In fact, let's change them all. Let's make them really obviously different numbers. Let's go for a thousand for the Avengers and a thousand and one for the next film. Then I can just quickly cheat and copy and paste the sequence down. So these will clearly stand out when we run the subroutine now. Uh, just before we run the subroutine, let's just quickly check what values we currently have in the film table. So if I open that up, there's our list of films in the Access database, and the running times are their original values at this point. So what we can do now, close that table down, head back to the VB editor, and let's just give the entire subroutine a quick run through. So apparently something's happened. Let's go back to Access and open up the film table, have a look at the film runtime in minutes, and there are all the changes. So if... Um, I should mention if there was more than one film with the same name, this would have updated every single film with that name. So if I had multiple Lincolns and multiple Skyfalls, etc., they would all have their values changed to the same number. That's one thing to be slightly careful of. You might want to make your tests a little bit more specific, your where clauses. But the cool thing is that you can update a ton of data in a single database using VBA code and reading values of cells from Excel. OK, so one more example just to finish off with this video. We haven't looked at the delete statement yet. So the final example is going to loop over the collection of films one more time, and it's going to check if the film genre is awful. And there's only one example of that type of film in our database. I shan't speak its name. If that film is that particular genre, awful, then a film with that name will be deleted from the underlying database. So the genre text actually didn't exist in the underlying database at all. So now we're going to be modifying data in a database, Access or SQL Server, based on information that's only contained in a spreadsheet. It's quite powerful stuff if you think about it. So what we'll need to do first is create a new function that creates the delete statement text. So let's go back to the VB editor and scroll down to the bottom of the module and let's cheat again. Let's create a new copy of this Access function copy and paste, and then we can make some modifications to this to make it create the delete method or delete statement. Let's start by changing the name of the function to get delete text access, and that means we'll also have to modify how we return a value to the function as well, so that should be delete text access or get delete text access as well. We can then modify the parameters because we only need to pass in the film name this time. We don't need to pass in the film time. We're only interested in deleting a film with a specific name. So we can get rid of the film time parameter altogether. And then we simply need to modify the SQL string that's generated. Now the delete statement is probably the easiest of all the statements we've covered in this video. So rather than update, we will say delete from TBL film. We don't need to set any field to be a particular value. We don't even need to say which fields we want to delete either. The delete statement deletes entire records. So we can remove that line altogether. And then the where clause of the statement is exactly the same as last time. It's whatever film name we decide to pass in, that's what will be deleted. OK, so that's the name of the function, or that's the, the function itself created. Now we need to incorporate it into our main subroutine. So let's head back up there now, and we'll start to replace the parts of this subroutine that we need to modify. So first of all, let's get rid of the part which says get update text access, and we'll change that to get delete text access. 
Of course, we only need to pass in the film name this time, so we can get rid of the parameter or the argument which passes in the film running time. So let's get rid of that. And we can probably, in fact, now squeeze the whole thing onto one single line. That looks much neater. We also need to include an if statement in this subroutine to make sure that we only generate the command text and execute the, the statement if the film is an awful film. So let's add an if statement just above this line. We'll say if r.offset 0,4.value equals awful, then. Then we need to, well, actually, no, we don't need to, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to indent these lines. I need to, otherwise I won't sleep tonight. And we need to add an end if. We do need to add an end if to make um, make the if statement complete. Now, it's worthwhile mentioning that the, um, the if statement is case sensitive. So if I'm comparing this piece of text against this piece of text, if it's not spelt with a capital A, then this won't work. So it's probably worthwhile quickly saying L case our offset 0, 4 value and testing that all against lowercase text as well. And then this is all we need to do in order to start deleting records from a database. So just a quick check back in the access table to see that that film is still there. The one whose name must not be spoken. There it is. And if we close that table down and go back to the VB editor and run the subroutine, something's happened at least. Back to access, open up the table again, and suddenly that film no longer exists. Oh, that's much better. Excellent. Now it's worth mentioning one factor that could affect your ability to delete records, and that's all to do with relationships in your database. If I quickly switch to the database tools tab and use to view the relationships, you can see that there is a one-to-many relationship between the film table and the cast table in this database. What that means is the field here, cast film ID, can only contain a value if that value already exists in the film ID field of the film table. So what that means is if I delete a film from the film table and its ID is removed, then any record in the cast table which used that film ID can no longer display that value. Now by default the way Access handles that is it prevents you from deleting a film from the film table if that film has already been used in the cast table. Now of course the records we've just added in this video have not then been assigned to cast records in the cast table so we can successfully delete any of those. But other records, so for example if I open up the film table and the easiest thing to do I think is scroll to the very bottom where I know there are some films with records, if I expand that you can see that there are some records in the corresponding cast table there for the film Jurassic Park. So I could not delete Jurassic Park by default. Now there are a couple of ways around it back in the relationships window. I can modify the relationship to either delete it altogether and that would allow me to delete records or if I edit the relationship in a bit more detail I can tell it what to do if I delete records from the film table. If I check this box cascade delete related records, what that means is if I delete a film that had records in the cast table, oh, I'm in the middle of using things at the moment so I can't actually do that, I can't make changes, um, but if I enforced that delete related records fact, um, feature, that would mean that if I deleted a film here and it had records corresponding to that film in the cast table, all the records in the cast table would also be deleted for that film. So taking that a step further, imagine we deleted a director with Cascade Delete. So we directed, deleted, say, Steven Spielberg. That deletes all of Steven Spielberg's films and then all, any, all roles played by any actor for Steven Spielberg's films as well. So you can potentially get rid of hundreds of records just by deleting a single one in one table. So it's something to be careful of when you're deleting records, but then you should only be deleting records from a database if you absolutely intend to do it in the first place anyway. So apart from that, it's a pretty powerful feature, the idea that you can write code in your VBA projects that can modify all this data in a database in sort of in a SQL Server or Microsoft Access. Effectively, the database type doesn't matter. So I think that's probably enough talking about modifying data for one, one video. Hope you found this one useful. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this training video, you can find many more online training resources at www.wiseowl.co.uk.